Hello there everyone. Today I am going to be talking about a lot of the generic skills that you have access to throughout all 12 factions of Battlefleet Gothic Armada 2. We're going to talk about the nuances, how you can get the most out of them, and we're also going to look into a handful of the more generic type upgrades, as well as like weapon abilities like torpedoes and novocans, so you can be acclimated and understand what their place is in the battle, and ideally how you can minimize the damage put upon you if you have to face off against these type of weapons. Since more often than not it is the Novocans, Torpedoes and like the special abilities a lot of these factions have that can really ruin your day really damn quickly and a lot of that does come down to inexperience for at the same time. It can be really simple to avoid them if your opponents are using them poorly or you just straight up equipped to help deal with them naturally through so either like dealing with fighters and bombers as like town protectors or the town merchant fleet which naturally has a lot of fighters at their disposal to easily deflect those type of strategies or just sheer mobility to allow you to dodge torpedoes like if as a chaos fleet or as the Eldari. But even then at the end of the day you can't be prepared for every situation just by equipment alone and you need to be able to react quick or just be able to respond swiftly to be able to deal with them and manage them accordingly. So that is what I'm hoping this video is going to serve for you. So you do not have to deal with the heartbreaking defeat of being stomped horribly by torpedo salvos or just being caught in an awkward position be with a combination of stasis bombs and Nova cannons. So the first of these skills is going to be the auger probe and this is probably one of the more common type of skills you will encounter especially when you are leveling up a brand new fleet for it is probably one of the more useful type of beginner skills to have access to and basically what it does is you can launch a beacon anywhere across the map it will begin traveling from your flagship at a certain speed providing vision as it goes along and then once it reaches the destination you laid down it will stop take about 10 seconds to deploy and then once it's fully deployed you will gain double the fission radius of the, what the beacon was originally providing for you. Allowing you to spot any enemies in that area, whether they're silent running, they're hidden, or just trying to grab objectives you will know ahead of time. And this will allow you to set up for harassing attacks or just be able to engage them properly. Ideally how you want to use this auger probe is, as I already hinted there, just launch at like certain strategic strategic points that you suspect your opponent's going to be focused on at the start of the game. And if you are playing up against something that is very stealth oriented or likes to try and flank, you can also use this in certain areas where you're most vulnerable or you think the enemy will take advantage of. Like perfect example would be maybe gas clouds that are in a certain area that you'd rather your opponent not utilize. And basically it serves as area denial for you. It limits the amount of approach options that your stealthy opponent will use to against you and that allows you to better fortify and protect yourself for when they do eventually do their attack run. Also to note, if the beacon ever collides with an enemy ship, it will stick onto them and it will provide vision to everywhere around that ship, as well as the vessel that it's stuck onto. So ideally, that is the situation you want, but with the slow travel speed and the kind of the really obvious awareness of where the beacon is because of the sensor pulses it's sending out it can be really easy to avoid since you need to literally fly right over it there's no like proximity range to it sticking but once it does deploy it can still stick onto enemy vessels if they fly over it so in the chaos of battle you may still have this happen on occasion the next skill is the auger disruptor bomb and simply put this isn't really a bomb it's just a map wide effect apparently so I think the naming is a little bit off but essentially what it does is it denies the scanner range the identification range of all your ships and reduces it down to 4500 range which is essentially the range that you have on all vessels to detect hit and fissile or was it invisible vessels and at first this may not seem very practical but its main synergy will be some nit like very specific type of factions that have access to a mission dissipator which is an upgrade we'll talk about later. A mission dissipator allows you to retain your ships to be hidden even when they're boosting so if you're playing a longer range or harassment type of fleet this may synergize well if you're worried about like extended range vision or at least being spotted so that way you can minimize a lot of the damage you'll be taking. It can be a really tricky skill to utilize fully because of the convenience that frigates have to just immediately spot ships with its scanner pulse ability. 
So at most, you will probably just be relegated to using this with a mission dissipator and basically a fleet that is dedicated to sniping down frigates to eventually blind your opponent. The supercharged void shield is an activatable ability that will make your flagship completely immune to damage for the next 10 seconds provided that your shields are online during that time. And even if your shields are down, it will drastically drastically increase the regeneration of those shields, making them come back up almost immediately, assuming you are not being hindered by any shield rege regeneration abilities like disruption bombs. This will perhaps be one of the most popular and favorites of a lot of fleets and 2v2 type matchups due to the limited amount of points you have access to. And even then, if your flagship is vital to the success of your fleet strategy, having a skill like this is going to make it so much more resilient and when you consider the fact that you are immune to critical hits outside of boarding and anything that just straight up ignores the shields, this will give you a lot more longevity with that ship as well essentially amplifying the power that the flagship already has and it's your ability to utilize it to its fullest is going to be essential to get the most out of this and with a one minute recharge on the ability and it be able to use an unlimited amount of times at that you, you are going to without a doubt get a lot of value out of this so long as you are playing the aggressive route or just under a lot of fire during these times the micro warp jump also ties into the same type of playstyle that if your flagship is your main ship to get something done or at least get victory for your fleet, this will allow you to negate one of the more ba basic weaknesses that most flagships have, especially if they are your battleship, and that's a lot of the time their lack of mobility. Using this allows you to use the fission of all your other ships or even the, your flagship itself, and you can just literally teleport across the map through this. If you hold down the mouse button, you can even change the heading of the ship, allowing it to, even just for like aggressive combat play, you could just rapidly change the heading. Or, more realistically, you could just use it to teleport behind your other ships, or just completely disengage from the battle at all, especially if the rest of your fleet's off doing other things like it's grabbing points and your flagship was just serving as bait at the time. There's a lot of practicality to this ability as well, it's just more centralized around more hit and run type of plays as opposed to the supercharged void shield being more encouraged towards the aggressive manners. I talked about the disruption bomb earlier and that's the next skill we're going to be talking about here. For simply put, this is an ability that turns off, it basically nullifies any shields on ships as well as the hull field on Eldari type of vessels and also pauses the health regeneration of the Necron fleet should you face off against them. It's like the largest of the three AoE type of skills that you have access to, for your generic skills at least. And as I said, it deactivates all their shields and it even pauses the regeneration for a full 20 seconds. So if you are utilizing your supercharged void shield, its effect will be completely nullified as far as regenerating your shields until the effect of the disruption bomb wears off. And ideally, this is a really strong ability for initiating attacks with, just because of how large it is, and you're likely to get multiple ships with this. It does have a 15 second charge up time, but even if it doesn't hit, you're probably forcing your opponent to rapidly move out of the way, and it'll allow you to get some initial firing blows on your opponent. This is perhaps one of the less impactful, though, still, of all the AoE bombs that you have access to, but it is still allows you to do permanent damage without having to worry about the regeneration of the shields, kind of like minimizing your attack run potential. It also has the little bonus of allowing you to displace your opponent if they panic needlessly. The stasis bomb, however, is probably the one bomb you need to take super seriously, as it's also one of my favorite type of skills as well, but essentially what it does is after a 15 second charge up time, which you can easily see from Disruption Bomb and all the other bombs, the charge up, it will slowly build up a circle and once it reaches the end it will explode and when it does, it will create a little dome that reduces all movement speed and even projectile speed by 9%. So essentially, if you're using macro cans in any form and you're trapped in this bubble, you are probably not going to be doing any damage to your opponents if they're firing at range, just because of the amount of time it'll take to, for your projectiles to actually escape the stasis bomb. This is also one of my favorite skills because while it's incredibly difficult to land the bomb directly without some other means to slow down or at least tie up your opponent, it also serves an amazing area deterrent 
for. Like I said, you don't want to be caught in this bubble, so more often than not, you're going to halt the engagement of your opponent's hard if you place it properly, or worst case, if you overshoot it or put it closer to your fleet and you're on the retreat, they will still be forced to go around it for the entire... As soon as they go in after the bomb effect, they can still get caught up by the slope as well as it also still interrupting projectiles that happen to go through the stasis bomb. So you can still use this effective area deterrent and to buy yourself a little bit of time even if you never land the bomb itself. You can get consistent value that way at least. However, if you ever do land with the stasis bomb, then this opens up an opportunity for a skill like plasma bomb to kind of do a massive amount of damage to your opponent. It's the smallest of all the AoE skills, but simply put, it's a portable Nova Can that you can put on any fleet that has access to the skill. It does 200 damage on the edge of the circle, with scaling up to 400 damage should the bomb detonate on a ship that's in the center of the blast radius. And it goes without saying how impactful this will be, especially for smaller cruisers, or light cruisers at least. Never mind the fact that it'll just completely obliterate most frigates that get caught up in this blast. Again, it has a 10 second charge up time, so it can be incredibly easy to dodge unless your opponent's not paying attention. So it will need to be set up if you are going to get any value at the, out of this at all. Since it doesn't really serve as much of a area deterrent like the stasis bomb just due to the sheer size of the skill itself. Now I'm going to talk about a lot of the generic upgrades that you have access to sort of all the factions of Armada 2. And you need to pay close attention to these upgrades as well as it says on the bottom line that what ships get affected by these upgrades. So you need to pay close attention as you're building up your fleet in preparation with these skills. The first upgrade we're going to talk about is the Navigational Shield. It goes by many names among all the other factions, but the most generic one is going to be the Navigational Shields, and it'll be easy to recognize since all the icons are the same for every faction, but simply put, it allows you to ignore the damaging and pen penalties of the asteroid field, mine fields, and even the spore fields that are generated by Tyranid fleets. It allows you to use the asteroid belt as a defensive measure, which is really good in a lot of circumstances for it actually gives an aim penalty to any ships that are shooting and a fleet that's within the asteroid field. This will also nullify the morale damage that you take while being asteroid field simply because of the reason that it was the hull damage that you were taking that caused the morale damage in the first place. So even though it doesn't technically state it in the description of the upgrade, you will not have to worry about being penalized heavily in that regard. The approved Augur Array is a simple upgrade that you can enhance the escort ships and light cruisers of your fleet to have a greatly increased identification range, allowing you to spot ships that are revealed but not quite detected just yet that are in the state where they are visible as little red icons on the map. However, this skill will not in any way enhance your ability to detect invisible ships, even your scanner range, which is fixed at 4,500 range. So you are not going to get a lot of value in that regard, and with the scanner pulse, it remains to be seen the practicality of the skill. However, you can use this skill to kind of detect ships without giving away your scanner pulse ability, which actually has a visual representation to the skill, which gives away where your frigate is at the time if you're worried about it getting hunted down. So. If there is any use for the skill at all, the upgrade at all, then that would probably be what you would use it for in that case. Now the RN Pattern Weaponry, this is technically the term that is used for all the Imperial Navy fleets, but almost every faction has something of this equivalent, where it extends the range of either all your weapons or at least a specific type of weapon in general. It applies only to your flagship, so like I mentioned with the micro warp jump and the supercharged void shield, if you need your flagship to be impactful throughout the entire duration of the battle, whether it's running away or fighting at a distance, this is the upgrade for you. It will allow it to constantly be fighting, it will allow it to constantly be doing damage, no matter where you are on the battlefield. The disruption overcharge ability is a bit of an odd one for if it gives you like permanent disruption of the Necron's hull regeneration every time you hit them with these weapons since it applies to all your cruisers, your line ships, as opposed to the flagship itself. But the additional damage it does to the shields, it originally used to be a 50% damage boost in Armada 1 that strictly worked only for lance weaponry. And now that it's applied to every single weapon that your ships have access to, this is generally 
a nice little damage boost if you're having trouble getting through shields or have a need to get through shields quickly for maybe simple reasons of bombardment cans for space marines with their high critical hit chance or the mega cans for the orcs. I mentioned Dissipators this upgrade I mentioned earlier in the video and what this essentially does is allow you to not reveal your ships when you use evasive maneuvers and this is pretty important since Emission Dissipate only really applies to like all head full and high energy turn which most of the factions have access to but you need to be very mindful of the wording that it says down below for what ships it applies. For Chaos Fleets and the Tau Fleets have it so that it affects every single one of their line ships whereas for the Imperial Navy and other factions it only applies to their escort ships and light cruisers. So you need to pay close attention to that but it allows you to be a lot more mobile without being vulnerable to retaliation fire, especially if you're playing a more cat and mouse harassment type of game. Armor piercing ammunition is a very noteworthy type of ability for not only do the Imperial factions have access to this, but also the, all the Eldari factions do in the upgrade Blessing of Fall. And essentially what it does is if you get within 4,500 unit range, which is a technically point blank range for your macro weaponry, it will treat all armor as being 50. And I don't need to tell you the value of this for it basically multiplies the damage that you're doing, especially if it's something heavily armored like Necrons or Space Marines to almost, what is it, two and a half times roughly of the damage you're doing. I don't know the exact maths in my head, but simply put, 83 armor down to the side armor of like an Imperial Navy ship is immediately like double the damage you're doing just on macro cans alone. And when you can add that further by reducing it down to 50, it goes without saying the potential that this has for damage in close. Although, since you are in close, it leaves you vulnerable to equal type of fire themselves. But if they're not equipped for point blank range engagements, you are sure to demolish the adversary if you are on, know what you're doing and you have a fleet designed for such a close range engagement. There are of course a lot more upgrades and skills available throughout all the factions, but the reason I'm not covering them is I plan on doing individual videos for each and every one of the factions, which where we'll be going over a lot of the practicality that those unique skills have. But those are generally the ones you can expect to see the most throughout your matches, simply because of the accessibility all the factions have to them. Now I'm going to talk about the activatable weapon systems you have to look forward to in Armada 2. For we have a lot of torpedoes for almost every faction and those that don't have torpedoes either have access to Nova Cans or the Star Pulse Generator for the Necrons. So we're going to look into those and talk a little bit on how they function and what you should do to deal with them. So the way that the torpedoes works is pretty straightforward. Almost all of the torpedoes are fixed to the prow of the ship. And when you mouse over the actual skill itself, it will show you a rough trajectory of how your torpedoes are going to travel across the map. These are for the Dumpfire torpedoes, mind you, for there are two different variants that have a tracking component to them that don't really outline their pathway. But ideally, almost all the torpedoes will have a bit of a spread to them, so you're gonna, when you fire them, they're going to get further apart from each other as they travel their distance. So they become a little less ideal to use for long range engagements, especially when you consider the three charges that you have for pretty much every single torpedo you have access to. They are primarily meant for close range engagements unless you wish to try and force your opponent to move in a certain pattern. Or you have access to torpedoes that are not actually useful for you. For the case of the Imperial Navy, they have access to melta torpedoes as a secondary type of torpedo they can fire with their own separate charges. However, the melta torpedoes only cause fire results. In the specific case of Necrons, they can uh, they are immune to fire results, so they are completely useless in that regard. So you can kind of use them in a niche situation there to kind of make that the Necron fleet maneuver in a different pattern or to burn off charges. But ideally, every single one of them do 90 points of damage, at least before armor mitigates it down. It always brings it down to the, a 50 armor and at least treats all armor as being 50 with a good chance to do a critical hit as well as an added bonus. So generally, they're going to be doing 45 damage all around with the exception of Eldar. All the Eldar factions have a different kind of torpedoes that are a little more resilient than their the counterparts with all the other factions. And they hit so much harder with the fact that they completely ignore armor. 
So they're going to be doing the full 90 damage. And how you technically deal with these is pretty straightforward. Simply put, if you get enough early warning time there, you can easily boost your ships away or use high energy turn to kind of narrow your ship. Make your profile a little bit smaller so that way less of the torpedoes are actually hitting you. Keep in mind there's only three charges to concern yourself with each of the ships. So if they are launching a large salvo at you and you can mitigate it or avoid it completely, then you are doing incredibly well for the rest of the battle, no matter how it turns out. The key thing is to minimize as much of the damage as possible, and if you have access to any forms of fighters, they will automatically fly over and attack them, especially if you have them patrolling the ships that are likely to get attacked by torpedoes. They will add an additional screen of defense for you, and in most cases, they could completely destroy torpedo squadrons with enough fighters, so you may not even need to do any face maneuvers. However, you do also have the point defense, which are specifically designed to also shoot at the torpedoes. However, how the point defense will function, you need to keep in mind, for uh, the point defense will always shoot at the closest torpedoes first. And if you try to panic and boost away, you may end up in a situation where you may accidentally be flying the torpedoes that are not actually getting shot down. So if you are not certain that you can avoid the torpedoes in time, then it pro your best bet would be to either turn your ship to face it to narrow the profile, or just keep your ship still and trust that your point defense can at least shoot the one or two torpedoes that are actually threatening to hit your ship. In a lot of cases, you can avoid it avoid the torpedo salvo altogether that way. It's a co common mistake to panic if you don't have the time for, like I said, you will fly into additional torpedoes and take a lot of damage that way needlessly. However, a lot of the times players will like to combo, fire all their torpedoes together, but that is not realistically possible due to the manual aiming that's required of these skills. And since they're fixed their prow on almost every faction, you are not likely going to be facing your prow to ship at all times. Since the Imperial Navy, Chaos, and all the other factions require broadside weaponry the majority of the time, you will need to actively turn, and that gives a keen eye opponent or a keen eye player an opportunity to see these torpedoes coming. And, in all, and the general rule with torpedoes is closer is better, so in the case of Eldar specifically, and really this is true of all factions, if they are getting closer than necessary, you can use that as a tell as well that torpedoes are coming your way. The audio cue is kind of really quiet at the time it's recording, so it's possible it may have been made more noticeable afterwards, but you are not going to reliably hear torpedoes coming, so you need to take preemptive measures if you are to avoid them at all. And in some rare situations, since there is a thousand unit range, which is the red line you see there, if you are within that, the torpedoes will do no damage to you at all because they haven't act quite activated the charge yet. So in theory, if you are close enough to the enemy, you could just ball rush into the ship and probably avoid torpedo damage that way. And as a bonus prize, if you're equipped for it, you could do some good ram damage as well. Now, boarding torpedoes and seeker missiles of the Tau Empire are a little bit different in that they actually track your ships. And this may sound incredibly intimidating since they do the same kind of damage potential with the Tau Empire and the Space Marines that have been specialized towards boarding, so their boarding torpedoes are exceptionally dangerous, but there are ways to work around this as well, using evasive maneuvers in your speed boost, or you could just straight up conceal your ship using a gas cloud or asteroid belt. These will immediately cause the torpedoes to lose their lock and they'll just fly off aimlessly. Although you still will need to be mindful of not get colliding into them since they're still going to go on to their current traje trajectory. They're just not going to follow after your ship at that point. However, the most dangerous type of combination you need to worry about regarding the torpedoes is when a player launches their fighters ahead of the torpedo squadrons. And the reason this is exceptionally dangerous is because the fighters are actually meant to distract your point defense, leaving the torpedoes themselves to be completely unharmed to completely maximize their damage potential. And this can be a really tricky thing to deal with. If you have no fighter base at all, you kind of have to rely on stalling by using your maneuvers to the best of your ability, or worst case, having some of your other ships kind of spread out to damage by getting in the way of whatever the target of the missiles are, which more often than not will probably be your flagship or anything that happens to be isolated at the time. But if you do have a fighter bay of some sort, there is a little trick you could do to kind of at least give your point defense a means to shoot the torpedoes directly. If you launch the fighters in a certain angle, 
their fighters will be forced to fly over to them and engage them. So if unless they're already on top of your fighters at the time, then you can just move your fleet away from the fighters and just give yourself a window for all your point defense to fixate entirely on the torpedo salvo and deal with them. It requires you to actually have a carrier ship to be able to pull this off. And if you have like very little squadrons, it may be short lived because of how quickly they're going to get shot down. But otherwise, you are going to ha have to brunt that storm if you don't have fighter bays. And if they are comboing with fighters and torpedoes, more often than not, that is their main strength for the fleet that they're fielding. So if you are able to mitigate that damage as much as possible, either using Brace for Impact, which also reduces damage and increases the, your point defense's accuracy, then you could come out on ahead when the actual battle itself occurs. Now, Novacans function as you, I demonstrate with the plasma bomb and the other type of bomb skills that you get in the game. They function very similarly. Hell, they even have the same type of charge up time. It's, the only difference is they're automatically equipped to each and every one of the ships that are armed with Novacans for either the Mechanicus or the Imperial Navy. And hell, even orcs have their own version of Novacan, which functions slightly different. That has three different kind of blasts that do only 100 points of damage, as opposed to the 200 to 400 damage of the plasma bomb and Novacans. So how you defend against these is functionally is same, similar to the plasma bomb. If you are not slowed down or pinned down by a stasis bomb, they can be relatively easy to dodge. However, you do need to be very wary of stasis bombs and not let yourself get caught in them. Otherwise, that will be a death sentence for you if you let let yourself get caught. The Star Pulse Generator on the other hand is a little tricky to dodge if for two reasons. For one, the Star Pulse Generator the Necrons fires immediately so there is no wind up or charge up time and they also have an inertialist drive which is they're all ahead full for comparison's sake. It allows them to teleport right on top of your ships there if you're within their scanner range and it allows them to do immediate 250 points of damage. There isn't really much you could do to weather that, especially since the Star Pulse Generator also has no charges so they can fire that indefinitely as the battle drags on. But you can at least see the signs and if you could keep your distance and maybe spread out your fleet you can minimize the impact that the Star Pulse Generator and associated skills with the Necrons can do. There is of course a lot more abilities and skills to talk about which we will go over in time. But I hope this video has been very helpful for you, especially with the torpedoes since they are going to be the most problematic and the ones you're going to have to learn to deal with the most since they are so commonplace. As I said, nearly all the factions have access to it so you're going to be facing off against them regularly so a keen eye and attention to detail will allow you to see them coming and if you can dodge them or minimize the damage then you are well underway just on that skill alone to find victory in every battle that you come up against. I thank you all for watching and I'm looking forward to doing more videos up in the future and talking a little bit more about the individual factions themselves. We're going to go over their strategies but that will take a little bit of time to prepare. I want to fixate entirely on each and every one of these factions for a good amount of time so I can at least be confident with my presentation of them for you. Thank you for watching and I will see you on the battlefield.